Okay, at this time, sergeants, can you please start your recordings? PC recording started. Cloud started. Backup is started. Okay, Sergeant Jones, we are ready with your opening. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And Chair, we are ready to begin. Okay, I need something to bang with. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our virtual hearing on FEMA flood insurance and resiliency along the waterfront. My name is Justin Brannan. I'm the chair of the council's uh, committee on resiliency and waterfronts. Um, I wanna acknowledge my other colleagues that have joined us so far today. Uh, I see Councilwoman Rose, Councilman Diaz Sr., and I think that's everyone for now. I'll announce other folks as they, um, as they join us. Uh, I'm going to quickly turn it over to our great uh, committee counsel, the mighty Jessica Steinberg-Alvin, to go over some procedural items before we get started. Jessica. Thank you, Chair. I am Jessica Steinberg-Alvin, counsel to the to the Resiliency and Waterfronts Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelists will be. The first panelist to give testimony will be Janie Bavishi. Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. I will call you when it is your turn to speak. For the question and answer period only, we will be joined by New York City Department of Buildings Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Code Development, Joe Ackroyd. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your, question, your questions. Thank you. I will now pass it to Chair Brannon to give an opening statement. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, oh, good morning again, everyone. My name is Justin Brannon. I'm the chair of the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. Um, I wanna welcome everyone to today's hearing, an important hearing on FEMA, uh, flood insurance and resiliency along the waterfront. Uh, as we heard during last month's oversight hearing on the eighth anniversary of Superstorm Sandy and the 2020 hurricane season, the city's 520 miles of coastline are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise, storm surge, and flooding. Floods are the most common and the most damaging natural disasters in the country. With the city's floodplain covering over 48 square miles, New York City has more residents living in the high risk flood zones than any other city in the United States. So I'm gonna say that again. With the city's floodplain covering over 48 square miles, New York City has more residents living in high risk flood zones than any other city in the United States of America. And that number is expected to rise to 72 square miles by 2050, an area larger than the borough of Brooklyn. As climate change worsens, the floodplain continues to expand landward. More property will be at risk of regular inundation from flooding. Damage caused by flood is not typically covered by standard homeowners uh, insurance policy. In 1968, Congress passed the National Flood Insurance Act, which created the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, 
Now, all properties located in the 1% flood zone, also known as the special flood zone hazard area that have a federally, a federally backed mortgage or have experienced a flood disaster event have flood insurance. For over 50 years, the NFIP has been the main provider of flood insurance and it's overseen by FEMA. FEMA creates flood insurance rate maps or firms to delineate areas at high risk of flooding. The firms are the basis for building codes and for flood insurance premiums in these flood uh, prone areas, but they're woefully out of date. The firms have not been significantly updated since 1983 and flood insurance rates are still based on the tw uh, 2007 firms. A lot has happened in the past 13 years. In 2010, before Superstorm Sandy hit the city, FEMA started updating the firms. They issued preliminary firms in 2015, but because FEMA overestimated the size of the 100 year floodplain and the height of the base flood elevations, an error that would have included 35,000 new homes and buildings into the special flood hazard area, the city went ahead and filed an appeal. FEMA ultimately agreed with the city and now the city is working with FEMA to update these firms at last. New preliminary firms are not expected to be released until 2023. Not only is this three years from now, but they will not account for the projected sea level rise or climate change. Firms help determine flood insurance requirements, flood insurance premiums, and building codes. But they're based on historical storms and flood events. Basically, they're based on things that have already happened. They're not forward thinking in any way. Because updated firms will only use past events to guide them, the city is also working with FEMA to develop maps that will use the best available data to map and model future flood risk. Although these maps will not be used for insurance purposes, they will help inform resilient design methods and we certainly look forward to their development, which is much needed. The firms tell property owners whether they need flood insurance or not, but the requirement to have flood insurance is based on a line drawn on a map. Floodwaters do not recognize lines drawn on a map. One major concern is that residents whose properties may be susceptible to flooding will not purchase flood insurance because according to the firms, their property is outside the floodplain. Another major concern is how struggling homeowners who currently do not have to purchase flood insurance will be able to afford it if FEMA's updated firms now include their properties. Flood Help New York, an online tool to help residents understand flood risk and flood insurance requirements, was created by the Center for New York City Neighborhoods in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. It offers resiliency audits and counseling to residents uh, residing in uh, flood prone neighborhoods. The committee today looks forward to hearing more about Flood Help New York and how it will help residents navigate the new flood insurance requirements to come. With rising sea levels, which will lead to more flooding events, more property owners will see their properties inundated with flood waters. Flood insurance is already costly and overly burdensome for many. Property owners can lower their annual insurance premium by elevating their homes. However, that is not feasible in many or most areas of the city, especially where properties are located on narrow lots or have attached or semi-attached buildings. We need to protect people already living along the coastline, but we cannot keep building in areas we know will regularly flood five, 10 or 20 years from now. And although storms affect all residents, they disproportionately impact minority and low income communities who live in flood prone areas with little green space to absorb the floodwaters. What is the city doing to address these disparate impacts? I look forward to hearing from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency during today's hearing. Before we begin, I wanna thank my committee staff, Committee Council Jessica steinberg Albin senior policy analyst and new dad, Patrick Mulvihill, senior finance analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, and of course, my senior advisor, John Yedin, 
for all their hard work in putting this together uh, behind the scenes and making me look like a champ today. So I will now turn it back over to committee counsel, Jessica Steinberg Alvin to swear in uh, our panel. Thank you, Chair Brannon. We will now call on members of the administration to testify. First, Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. For the question and answer period only, we will also be joined by Joe Ackroyd, Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Code Development from the New York City Department of Buildings. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Director Bavishi and Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd, I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Bavishi. I do. Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd. I do. Thank you. Director Bavishi. You may begin when ready. Good morning. I am Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. I would like to thank Chair Brannon and Council Members Diaz, Constantinidis, Ulrich, and Rose for the opportunity to testify today. I would also like to acknowledge my colleague, Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd from the New York City Department of Buildings, who will join me today in answering your questions. I would like to begin by providing a brief history of the National Flood Insurance Program to provide context for the city's role in supporting New Yorkers who live and work in the floodplain. The National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, is a federally legislated program administered by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, to underwrite and make flood insurance available to the public. Private insurance companies that participate in the NFIP sell flood insurance policies and manage claims for FEMA's guidance. The NFIP today not only provides flood insurance, but also maps flood risk and provides direction concerning floodplain management, such as guidance regarding building codes to ensure flood resilient construction. Since its inception, the NFIP program has been subsidized to some extent by the backing of the federal treasury. However, as flood, flooding has become a more expensive hazard, the program has been under pressure to cover its rapidly increasing losses. The NFIP was generally financially stable from its inception through 2005. While there were annual flood events, the program was able to sustain itself year over year by using the revenue generated from the collection of premiums to pay, pay claims. Due to the unpredictable frequency of flooding, the economic impact of flooding in any given year could vary significantly. After many years of relatively low damages, the NFIP received almost eight times the number of claims received in any prior year after hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Wilma struck in 2005. Given the highest number of claims, given the high number of claims, including Sandy, the NFIP is now approximately $20 billion in debt to the US Treasury. The enormous debt for NFIP reflects the gap between the premiums homeowners are paying and the actual cost of the risk homeowners bear living in exposed floodplains. And this risk is increasing due to climate change. Given the mounting debt after 2005, the need to reform the NFIP was acknowledged by both the U.S. Senate and the House. However, there was failure to advance a long-term solution, in part due to the size of the debt. As a result, the program lapsed four times during 2008 and 2012 and was extended 17 times. These lapses caused uncertainty in real estate and insurance markets. Consequently, Congress began efforts to address reforms to the NFIP in 2012 by passing the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012. Bigger Waters sought to address the financial stability of the NFIP by phasing out long-standing subsidized rates that did not reflect actual risk. The prevailing argument for the increases was that only about 20% of NFIP policies received subsidies. Therefore, not all policies would be impacted by the increases. However, in older cities like New York, over 80% of our policies benefited from those subsidies, which were based on the year the house was built. With these subsidies being repealed, homeowners could see rate increases as much as 18% a year. New York City's efforts supported the passage of, New York, of the flood, sorry, the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act in March of 2014. 
And, and this passage was integral in slowing the pace of rate increases. However, even with our efforts and this critical legislation, real increases to insurance rates have amounted to 11% in the past year alone. Since the passage of both Bigart Waters and the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act, several other severe storms have placed an increased strain on the NFIP. In 2017, for instance, Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria resulted in a combined $294 billion in damages. We can and should expect future storms worsened by climate change to cause even more extensive and more costly property damage. As a result of Bigart Waters, we know that flood insurance today remains a cost burden for many New Yorkers. In 2013, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency commissioned a report to look at the impact of rising flood insurance rates on property owners in New York City. This report allowed researchers to see how policy changes to the NFIP could affect the cost of home ownership. The report identified three major takeaways. First, grandfathering, which means being allowed to keep your current zone when new maps are issued, is one of the most effective affordability tools available. Second, targeted means-tested vouchers or credits are the most cost-effective tools for ensuring affordability. And finally, mitigation is expensive, but it is more cost-effective when it results in reduced premiums and financial support made available through grants for mitigation. This study focused on five New York City communities in which, higher, in which there's a higher risk of flooding and found that the cost of flood insurance is burdensome for about one quarter of households in owner-occupied one to four family residences. And it's much more burdensome for low, lower income residents. Within this affordability crisis, we also know that flood risk is increasing due to sea level rise and increased intensity of coastal storms. In 2025, the city anticipates that FEMA will release new flood maps that reflect this increased risk. Separately, FEMA is also expected to transition to a new methodology for insurance rates known as Risk Rating 2.0 next year. The city is highly concerned about how Risk Rating 2.0 might further increase premiums for New York City residents, and we're not the only ones. Several members of New York's congressional delegation have called for FEMA to provide more transparency, and in September of this year, Representative Max Rose introduced H.R. 8311, which would require FEMA to produce a report regarding the potential impacts of any changes to risk, the risk rating 2.0 methodology for the NFIP before it is implemented. Given the increased flood risk facing New York City and our understanding of the affordability issues facing New Yorkers living in the floodplain, the city has been in active conversation with congressional staff in the House and Senate since early 2016, advocating for reforms to the NFIP program. The NFIP program must be reauthorized by Congress periodically. These windows offer opportunities for broader reform. However, since 2017, Congress has provided 17 short-term extensions, much like they did in 2012. The city's NFIP advocacy platform emphasizes several reforms, including offering premium credits to consumers who mitigate their properties against climate risk through measures other than elevation, increasing the availability of mitigation funding for all building types, improving FEMA's flood mapping process, enhancing oversight and management of private insurance companies that issue flood insurance, and accelerating the acceptance of private flood insurance alternatives. The centerpiece of the city's platform is instituting means-tested vouchers as an alternative to the current system, which is based on the age of the building structure. A means-tested voucher program, which with broader mitigation credits, can allow for low-income homeowners to afford NFIP coverage. Although some mitigation credits are available already, because it is not financially or physically feasible to elevate all structures in New York City, vouchers and other mitigation options outside of elevation are critical solutions we also need to pursue. Any additional support that council can provide in amplifying this platform is absolutely welcome. Additionally, in advance of new rate maps and guidance from FEMA related to risk rating 2.0, our office is working tirelessly to increase flood insurance enrollment, encouraging New Yorkers to take advantage of grandfathering into more affordable insurance rates. We've had considerable success so far. Since Hurricane Sandy, overall flood insurance en enrollment increased approximately 50% citywide. Even more importantly, enrollments within the current lower risk X zone areas are up about 91%. As a reminder, homeowners in the lower risk X zones aren't currently required to purchase flood insurance by law, but may have this requirement imposed when FEMA's new maps are adopted in 2025. Our success with flood insurance enrollment is largely due to our partnership with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, who manages the Flood Help NY project. Flood Help NY provides an online tool to communicate flood risk and insurance requirements 
and operates a program that offers resiliency audits, backwater valve installation, and counseling to eligible residents in some flood prone neighborhoods. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic this summer coinciding with hurricane season, the city along with Flood Help NY increased our outreach to vulnerable New Yorkers. And this included providing a briefing for many of your offices on insurance enrollment for your constituents. Together, we distributed critical information re reminding New Yorkers how to protect their information and assets this hurricane season. This helped ensure that New Yorkers already hit by the pandemic and the corresponding economic crisis would not be surprised and unprepared for an additional destabilizing event. We hope that you continue to send your constituents to floodhelpny.org for more information about their risk. I also want to raise your attention that because Flood Help NY is funded by federal investments related to Hurricane Sandy that are due to expire in 2022, future funding is critically needed to continue this essential program in the next fiscal year. In addition to our federal advocacy and, our, and work with Flood Help NY, our office also partnered closely with advocacy groups and legislators to advocate for improved disclosure and transparency at the state level related to flood risk. It's critical that prospective homeowners and renters, and not just people already living in the floodplain, have the information they need about the risks they may face and the responsibilities related to flood insurance. In the last legislative session, State Senator Brad Hoyleman introduced Senate Bill 8439 to improve flood risk disclosure during real estate transactions, which would improve transparency for both buyers and renters. Our office supports this effort and looks forward to seeing it move forward in the state legislative session in the year to come. As we also discussed during the Hurricane Sandy anniversary oversight hearing on October 27th, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency is advancing extensive critical climate adaptation efforts and policies throughout the city to reduce the risk and impact of flooding in highly vulnerable areas. In conclusion, I would like to thank the committee for this opportunity to discuss the extensive work this administration has done to advocate for affordable flood insurance for all New Yorkers. We are committed to continuing to work with you as well as our external and federal partners to improve and expand clarity, transparency and access to critical information and services and to advance essential affordability and mitigation advocacy at the federal level to reform the National Flood Insurance Program. I look forward to joining my colleague Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd and answering any of your questions. Thank you, Director Bavishi. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Brannon. For these questions, we will additionally be joined by Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Code Development, Joe Ackroyd from the New York City Department of Buildings. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. As a reminder, if council members other than Chair Brannon would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Thank you. Chair Brannon, please begin. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, thank you, Jeannie. Good to see you again. I um, appreciate some of that clarity. Um, <clears throat> so the one thing I, I was reading last night, uh, FEMA estimates that approximately 13 million people live within the, the 100 year flood zone. Uh, but there was a 2018 report that was published um, that argued that the real number of people exposed to flood risk is really closer to 40, over 40 million. Um, based on your expertise, why do you think there's such a big discrepancy in those numbers? Uh, sure. Thanks, Chair Brandon, for the question. I, I, I just want to clarify that you're talking about numbers um, across the, the country. Say that again? It sounds to me like those numbers are people living in the floodplain across the country. Yes. Um, yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So I, I think that um, the discrepancy in those numbers is probably related to some of the things that you mentioned in your testimony, right? The, the National Flood Insurance Program um, is responsible for mapping the floodplain. Um, I, I'm, I, first of all, let me just let me just say up front that I'm not familiar with the, the um, article that you read or the study that you're referencing. So I'm, I'm uh, speculating a bit here um, because I don't know what the methodology for that study was. Um, but but I, I would imagine that some of the things that they may attribute that that discrepancy to are things like 
um, you know, these maps um, uh, taking a long time to produce uh, by FEMA and um, often they are quite outdated. Um, Remapping uh, doesn't take pay, pay, place at a pace that we would all want um, and expect given uh, the intensifying climate crisis. Um, and so, you know, often uh, many municipalities are relying on old maps. Um, it's possible that that at least one big reason for the discrepancy that that article referenced is that um, the, the they're probably counting the number of people that are officially mapped in the FEMA flood maps versus the number of people that are exposed to, to flooding based on current scientific information about flood risk. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a pretty shock. I know you didn't, you didn't write the report. It's just a pretty shocking discrepancy. It's, it's, it was a report in 2018 published in the Journal of Environmental Research Letters. I know we all love reading those, uh, that journal. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 the, the discrepancy is pretty wide. FEMA is saying 13 million. Um, and this journal is saying um, it's, it's closer to 41 million. So there's startling. Um, but uh, along the same lines, I mean, FEMA, FEMA's flood maps um, have certainly been criticized uh, for being outdated and, and, and underestimating flood risk across the country. Um, I guess, would you agree with those criticisms and, and how are you, how is the city working with FEMA to update these maps for, for the city? I, I mean, I would agree that, that the, this process takes far too long, right? And we, we wanna um, uh, both make it expedient, but also make it as accurate as possible. And I think one of the um, challenges that we saw um, back in uh, 2013, um, you know, as you mentioned in, in your opening remarks, um, FEMA uh, had started a, a process uh, prior to Sandy to uh, remap our floodplain. Um, they, uh, in order to make the process uh, quick, they, um, they, they took some uh, measures to, to speed it up and um, that led to some inaccuracies. So what we are trying to balance is making this process as accurate as possible. We wanna make sure that we have scientifically accurate information by which we are, um, uh, by which FEMA is setting flood insurance rates, um, but and also move it along as, as quickly as possible. So those are the things that we are trying to balance for New York City. Yeah, I mean it certainly feels like a race against time, um, but at some point, you know, we have we have to release something. Um, the city's floodplain covers more than forty-eight square miles. Um, the area is expected to grow to 72 square miles by 2050. Um, has the city identified what neighborhoods would be most affected by the projected expansion? And, and if so, what are we doing to, to help? Sure, so, so I just wanna clarify that while we are working with FEMA to uh, develop new flood insurance rate maps. Um, we, we are also separately working with the New York City Panel on Climate Change to understand how flood risk will impact the city due to sea level rise. Um, and uh, you know, I uh, testified in great detail um, just a couple of weeks ago at the Sandy anniversary hearing about the uh, very large portfolio that we are advancing across the city to uh, make sure that we're building resilience to flood risk. Um, that includes strengthening our coastline with um, coastal protection projects, um, major coastal protection projects, uh, 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 advancing. Um, uh, in fact, we just uh, uh, right after the hearing broke ground on the um, Rockaways Atlantic Shoreline Resiliency Project, which we're very excited about, um, and much more is coming on that front. Um, we are also strengthening buildings. Um, we are uh, uh, hardening our infrastructure and uh, critical services and making investments in neighborhoods to make sure that they are more financially resilient, which includes flood insurance outreach, but um, also includes things like supporting small businesses and improving social cohesion. Um, so we are uh, taking a multi-pronged approach and certainly not waiting for FEMA's maps to build a more resilient city and prepare for these impacts. I mean, do you, do you have a list or an idea of, of neighborhoods? I guess my question is if, if, this, if the floodplain right now covers 48 square miles and we're saying that by uh, in 30 years from now, it's expected to grow to 72 square miles. 
is it just further um, landward in the existing neighborhoods? Are there neighborhoods that are being added? Are there neighborhoods that um, are sort of are now, you know, on watch, on warning, or is it just that it's it's going to be further landward in the existing neighborhoods? Yeah, I, I mean, we'd be happy to schedule a briefing with you on how the floodplain is changing um, over time. Um, I, I, I would say that, you know, in large part, the floodplain is expanding inland. Um, it is expand. It's it's go. It's going to be deeper into uh, coastal neighborhoods. Um, but uh, I, you know, again, we would happy be happy to schedule. We'd be happy to schedule a briefing with you and, and go over those maps. Yeah. And all of this information is publicly available, by the way, on um, our flood hazard mapper, which is hosted by the Department of City Planning. You can uh, see the maps and um, click layers on and off uh, between the current floodplain and future floodplains so that you can actually see exactly how the floodplain is expanding. What's that website? It's the flood hazard mapper um, that's hosted by the D Department of City Planning. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important as we do education around this and outreach that people understand that just because they, they can't see the water from their house doesn't mean that they're not, you know, at risk. Um, well, you know. going back to flood insurance, you know, we absolutely encourage all New Yorkers to uh, purchase flood insurance. Um, if you're not in um, uh, in in one of the the um, existing flood zones, it's only about five hundred dollars a year. Um, and because there are New Yorkers that are susceptible to flood risk, even if they do not live on the coast, um, flooding can come in. Multi flooding is caused by multiple hazards, including uh, precipitation. Um, and so, you know, just to be safe, we, we encourage all New Yorkers to, to purchase flood insurance. Um, so more than 70,000 structures are located within the current uh, floodplain in, in New York City. Um, obviously, as climate change worsens, the floodplain expands, more structures are going to be at risk. Um, how seriously is the city taking this and, and what are we doing to prepare uh, for these challenges and, and, and how is the city incorporating, um, you know, the nature based um, solutions in, in, in uh, adjacent to the current projected flood plans? Um, so uh, by, by my data, we currently have 36,000 buildings in the, the current effective floodplain. And um, we have, um, you know, one of the strongest building codes in the world, um, meaning that- Wait, it, sorry, you're saying this, there are only 36,000 structures? 36,000 uh, 36, buildings in the current effective floodplain, that's right. That seems very low, no? There, there are 75, the number that you quoted is accurate when you account for the, the structures mapped on the preliminary flood insurance rate maps. Okay. So, so, uh, so it's, but it's probably closer to that. I mean, 48 square miles, I, don't, I think there's more than 36,000 structures and almost 50 square miles. Well, we can come back with, with specific numbers, uh, but I think as far as the effective flood insurance rate maps, those maps that you talked about that, that hadn't been updated since 1983, there's around 36,000 buildings mapped in the special flood hazard area on those particular maps. And the preliminary flood insurance rate maps, I think um, would be closer to the number that you, you quoted. Yeah, because I think we got those numbers from one of your PowerPoint slides. Sure, um, well, I, I would just highlight the fact that uh, we are also enforcing for development by way of adoption in the New York City building code the preliminary flood insurance rate maps. Um, so we've adopted for development purposes, the preliminary flood insurance rate maps. So while for, for insurance purposes, um, mandatory insurance purposes, uh, the effective flood insurance rate maps that 32,000 buildings um, have to uh, procure insurance when required. But as far as uh, the development in the special flood hazard area, the construction codes adopt the uh, both maps, the effective flood insurance rate maps and the preliminary flood insurance rate maps. So um, that's one way in which we are uh, accounting for future risks by enforcing the more stringent 
uh, of the two special flood hazard areas as delineated on both maps. Okay, so I guess my concern is if we know that this is growing, right? I mean, no one, no one is in denial that this that the floodplain is growing. We're, I assume we're not waiting to notify folks that you're probably going to be in the next set of maps, right? Are we doing any proactive sort of education or outreach to folks that are likely going to be um, within the floodplains as they expand? or as the maps expand? Absolutely, as I mentioned in my testimony, we have been um, doing uh, outreach in, in, to people living in the X zone. Th these are people who are currently not required to buy flood insurance. Okay. Um, we've actually been, been able to, through this outreach that we've done, outreach and education, we've been able to increase enrollment in the X zone by 91% since Hurricane Sandy. That's fantastic. Um, how, tell me, just that's that's amazing. How are you, um, like, how are we doing that? So if I have a house that is now in that zone, how am I being notified or contacted? Um, sure, let me walk through all the ways that we are um, doing outreach. So, um, so th there are a number of things that we're doing. Um, we are uh, providing trainings and information um, uh, and, and uh, uh, about NFIP, about the flood insurance program and flood insurance more generally, flood risk more generally um, to city agencies and nonprofits, as well as annual briefings for local, state, and federal elected officials. Our goal here is to make sure that we're um, really sort of building the army of people who can get this information out to New York City residents. Um, so it's really important that offices like yours help us get this information out. Um, we, in particular, work with city agencies such as HPD, DCP, and New York City the emergency management to provide flood insurance information to communities through existing outreach and communication channels. Um, we've, uh, since Hurricane Sandy, participated in hundreds of events providing information about flood risk and flood insurance uh, for New Yorkers and sharing numerous floodhelpny.org postcards and easy to read pocket maps um, of the New York City floodplain. Um, we've also uh, uh, taken on some significant consumer education efforts since 2012. So, um, you know, these are things like advertisements in city bus shelters, local and multilingual media ads and community papers, targeted digital and social media outreach, and direct mail efforts to homeowners. Um, and more recently, um, we uh, took on a really visible campaign of, uh, about preparing for this year's hurricane season that was um, uh, done in collaboration between MOR and Flood Help NY. Um, the city actually worked with partners to run ads on Link NYC kiosks in September and at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal that ran from September until the end of last week. Um, Flood Help NY also does targeted social media outreach. Um, and then we're also partnering with community organizations to, par to target low income New Yorkers and vulnerable populations in particular. So those are some of the ways that, that we are reaching uh, New Yorkers um, and, and educating them about their flood risk and talking to them about flood insurance um, so that they can take steps to stay safe. That's great. So you said, give me that stat again. You said 91%, what's in that? 91% in the X zone since 2012. 91% of people in that zone since 2012 have signed up? I'm sorry, 91% that we, we've increased enrollment um, okay. in flood insurance policies by 91% in the X zone. No, that's great. And this is really important because this also means, you know, affordability is also the cent a centerpiece of our uh, flood insurance outreach and advocacy work. And um, this means that they can be grandfathered in as the flood, in flood plane expands. So when FEMA releases new flood maps, many of the people in these X zone, as you're saying, you know, will be required to, to purchase uh, flood insurance. Um, and so we want to make sure that they're locking in lower rates now um, and so that the that their flood insurance can stay affordable. Right. So what, how does that work? I mean, I, I'm not familiar. Luckily, I, I live above the floodplain, so I, I don't I don't have to worry about it. But what does that as far as I mean, I know you're, you're not an insurance salesman, but what does that look like as far as um, in terms of pricing? Is there support for folks that can't afford it? How does that work? 
Um, so one of the, the um, most affordable, uh, most effective affordability tools, as I mentioned in my testimony, is grandfathering. So right, right. what this means is it, you're allowed to keep your current zone when new maps are issued. Um, and this is why we are so focused on our outreach and education in the X zone. If we can uh, get people to enroll um, when they have lower rates, when new maps are released and the uh, zones expand um, uh, and, they're and some of these residents are required to purchase flood insurance, flood insurance, they will uh, be locked in at lower rates. Um, and this is an incredibly effective affordability tool and one that we're right. advocating to um, ensure that uh, is, it continues to be a part of the National Flood Insurance Program. But we are also advocating for means-tested vouchers or credits. Um, so th th again, this is another cost-effective tool for ensuring affordability. Um, and, and essentially what we're saying is that rates should, should in part at least be, be uh, based on uh, a resident's affordability to pay, uh, 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 ability to pay. Ability to pay, sure. Um, and, and so uh, we're also advocating for this as part of our um, NFIP reform platform. Um. So how how often does the city? Um, I know the mayor, you know, has an office of federal affairs or whatever it's called. Um, how often do, do do you meet with um, you know congressional representatives about um, NFIP and 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 you know engaging on this stuff for advocacy reasons? Yeah, I, I mean, we are continuing to keep the line communication open with um, uh, congressional uh, uh, leaders on both sides of the aisle and both chambers. Um, in fact, you know, the study that we released in 2016 ended up being the basis of um, uh, 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 bills to reform the NFIP program on uh, in both chambers. Um, so, you know, we're really a leader in, in, in thinking about how the program should be reformed. But unfortunately, we just haven't seen Congress act beyond introducing bills. They, the, those bills haven't moved forward and it hasn't led to real reform. Um, instead, we've seen them kick the can and extend the program uh, through short-term extensions um, since 2017. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, Flood Help NY? Um, has it been helpful to residents? What, what resources um, are provided and, and what sort of educational programs are provided to communities through it? Sure, absolutely. So so let me just start by saying that all of the um, you know, outreach that I was describing, um, it, it, it is, uh, Flood Help NY is absolutely an integral component of the outreach and education that we're doing. It's the main way we are reaching out to New Yorkers and educating them about flood risk. Um, so just to take a step back though, Flood Help NY is a user-friendly web platform, and it's a program that provides residents with both information on flood risk and flood insurance requirements. Um, there are three components of Flood Help NY. One is a user-friendly web platform that includes an address search tool that returns free property-specific flood risk information. So you can actually go to floodhelpny.org, put in your address, and understand information about your flood risk. Um, second, Flood Help NY also provides home resiliency audits and counseling. Um, so this includes a visit by a team of professional engineers and surveys to, surveyors to assess your property for flood risk. Um, and in, in some cases, homeowners may also be eligible for free backwater valve installation through this process. Um, and then finally, marketing and outreach is the, the third component of Flood Help and Why, which includes printed materials and direct engagement of property owners at community meetings and other events. So as I mentioned, since Hurricane Sandy, there, there have been hundreds of event, events where we've disseminated flood, floodhelpny.org postcards and easy to read pocket maps of the, of the floodplain. What else can be done? Um, if, I, if I live in a, you know, an attached house or if I'm in a spot where it's impossible, I'm a homeowner and it's impossible for me to elevate my house, um, what other options do, do homeowners have to make their home safe from flooding? Um, so, th so there are a range of options that homeowners have to make their home safe from flooding. The, the challenge is, is that um, you know, these options can be expensive and currently the National Flood Insurance Program does not recognize um, most other options as um, uh, uh, ways to reduce your premium. Um, and so what we've been advocating for at the federal level is to um, acknowledge that 
in a dense urban environment like New York City, where we have all these unique circumstances and elevation is not always possible, we need to have other mitigation, uh, other mitigation options that are recognized and eligible for a premium credit that would incentivize those kinds of retrofits to make homes safer. And then, and then also we need to be able to access grants um, in order to uh, help advance those mitigations. Um, so we've been advocating for both of those things at the federal level as part of our NFIP reform platform. But what are some, what are some of the, like, if I can't elevate my house, what else can I do? So, so one one um, uh, option is is what I uh, uh, mentioned as part of the flood help and why program a backwater valve installation. Um, this is something that you know makes sure it helps to make sure that the uh, water in the the sewer line is just flowing one way um, during a flooding event, and you're not uh, your home is not um, uh, uh, subject to to flooding um, uh, or uh, you know the backwater. Uh, 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 what am I with them? Bought backwater uh, flooding from uh, from uh, during a flooding event. Okay. There there are some some extreme measures that that uh, one could take as far as abandonment. Um, you could perhaps fill fill a basement, uh, abandon the uh, ground floor use and wet flood proof that space. However, that would result in loss of uh, of the, the the use of the space, and if there's uh, rental income coming in from that space. It, it may offset the insurance savings. So there, there are hard decisions that people have to make with regard to balancing those two issues. Yeah. I mean, if you can't elevate your home, you can't elevate your home. What do, you, what do they want, expect you to do? I mean, um, so what, what are the, so what is the city's policy or, 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 or your views on, on constructing homes and businesses in areas that uh, regularly flood now. So what, like, what are we talking about five, 10, 20 years from now? Um, how does the city feel about building in these areas? And, and should we be um, encouraging property owners or builders, developers, whatever, to move away um, from these flood zones if we know five, 10 years from now that, you know, they're going to be in, in the zone? Yeah, so, you know, in terms of um, uh, uh, building in the flood zone, I, there are a couple of things I would mention. Um, one is that we are focused on providing risk awareness and information. We want to make, we want to make sure New Yorkers can make informed decisions about um, you know, where they're purchasing their homes and what the risk is. That's why, you know, one of the things I mentioned in my testimony is that we're actually working um, with the uh, with, with State Senator Hoyleman's office um, to advance a, a piece of legislation that would require more transparency about flood risk at the point of sale. Currently, New York State has um, very poor regulations. We, uh, uh, there's a loophole in the system that allows a, a seller to pay a fee and get out of disclosing flood risk um so we want to close that's that's, wait wait wait. so if i'm <laughs> if i'm selling someone a home i don't have the same way i have to disclose if i never got a buildings department permit sorry joe for the new boiler i installed um no i didn't do that but if i were to um i don't have to tell the the, the it's not on my lease or it's not part of the closing that they say hey by the way your house is in a flood zone that's and that's I'm I'm not coming at you. That's a state law, right? So th there's currently a loophole, and we're and you can pay a small the seller that's can a pay a loophole. <laughs> the payer can pay a small fee and not have to disclose flood risk. And so we're working to close that loophole. Oh my god! Yeah, we need to talk about that. Happy that to is talk. That's insane. You can, so right now the loophole is I pay a guy and they say okay we won't say anything about it being in a flood zone. Yeah, it, it, you pay five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. <laughs> Oh. That is totally insane. All right, we got to talk about that. That needs to be fixed like immediately. All right, Jesus. Um, that's crazy. Um, okay. So I think you, Janie, I think you mentioned earlier uh, in your testimony a little bit about the debt that uh, I think NFIP is like $25 billion in debt after uh, some major hurricanes. Um, how successful was the, um, the flood insurance reform act 
in, in making an NFIP financially stronger? Or has that all gone out the window now because of COVID and everything else? Well, the Flood Insurance Reform Act was really focused, um, among other things, on slowing the rate of increases um, that we were seeing. So I, I think there's much more work to do in making NFIP uh, financially stronger. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think that will be part of the consideration when Congress actually takes up NFIP reform. Um, I mean, are there other, I'm sorry, are there other providers or better pr providers that have been more successful at providing flood insurance and NFIP? Um, you know, I, I think that part of what we are um, working to do, uh, and and one of the other things that we're um, uh, we are uh, advocating for in our reform is is accelerating the acceptance of private flood insurance alternatives. Um, I think you know that's something that is uh, closely regulated by FEMA right now, um, and so that's you know that's a, a, another topic that we hope will be taken up um, during a, yeah. a really robust. Uh, reform effort. Yeah. All right. I just I had one more thing. Um, the 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 State Department um, of Environmental Conservation uh, released guidance documents for state funded uh, and, and permitted projects to incorporate sea level rise and um, and flooding into a project's design. Um, and siting. I guess it was pursuant to the Coastal Risk Resiliency Act. Um, the city's coastal resiliency and flood prevention pr projects generally require state permits. Uh, has the city reviewed these guidance documents and are we taking, or what is the city doing to incorporate the, the mitigation measures that were discussed in these guidance documents? Yeah, I, I, I mean, we, we comply with all state and federal regulations in our uh, buildings and infrastructure projects. I'll also say that, you know, we um, have uh, incorporated, uh, first of all, again, you know, our, our buildings code, our building code is um, one of the most resilient building codes in the entire country. And um, we also have released our own climate resiliency design guidelines, which um, provide uh, projections uh, and, and guidance, not only for sea level rise and coastal storms, but also intense precipitation and extreme heat and provide guidance on how to incorporate those projections into uh, buildings and infrastructure projects. Um, so th there are, you know, multiple paths that we're using to ensure that we're taking future risk into account. So I guess, I mean, if I'm reading between the lines, I mean, it's sort of the idea that the city um, wants to take it a step further. I mean, because it's sort of, you know, because we've got 520 miles of coastline. I mean, there are, are, are there additional um, flood prevention measures that the city will incorporate into these design and siting uh, projects in, in the floodplain? Is that the plan? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we are also, as you mentioned, working to develop these future flood risk maps um, that uh, was part of the appeals process um, with, with FEMA in 2016. Um, these maps are meant to be uh, a, a, a tool that will help uh, future regulation going forward to make sure that we're building as resiliently as possible. Right on. Um... Okay. I appreciate it, guys. Janie, Joe, thank you so much. Uh, that's all I have. And I don't think I have any questions from council members. I did want to recognize, if I didn't already, that Councilman Ulrich had joined us. Um, and, and of course, Councilman Rose, is, uh, Councilwoman Rose. Deb, you have a question? You're on mute. Okay. Hey, hey, okay. Hi. Hey. <laughs> right on. You how know, are you? Um, Chair, I had um I had uh questions that were very similar to yours and due to your in-depth, you know, <laughs> questioning, um I got most of my answers. Um so I, I want to thank you. I, I really want to thank you for um for digging down and and getting that information. Um so I just have um a couple of questions in terms of um, the um, flood help and why um, you you said that you provide resources to um, homeowners um, 
is that are those resources um uh is there any charge to them for those resources are they free you said you bring in engineers to you know to to assess their their property and how they might uh, mitigate flood damage um are there um are these resources that you provide through flood flood help ny um free or are there is there a cost uh, attached to them uh, these, uh, thank you for the, the question, Councilwoman Rose. The, the, these resources are free, but I, I will um, just uh, highlight that you know th there is a limited geographic scope um, uh, for the resources that are available because the program was launched in 2016 with federal funding that um, uh, uh, came from uh, came, came through the state. Um, and so currently the program is available in Bensonhurst, Bergen Beach, Brighton Beach, Canarsie, Coney Island, and a number of other communities I can uh, make sure you've got the whole list. But our, our goal is, is, is to expand the program citywide and um, we need to avail, identify available funds to do that. Um, it's also critical to mention, as I mentioned in my testimony, that the funding for this program will expire in 2022. So we would really like to, in, we would really like to partner with council to explore long-term funding solutions for the program because it is so critical that this program continues. Um, you talked about marketing and, um, and outreach. Um, and it seemed like it was pretty extensive um, and, and you were utilizing, um, you know, governmental offices and, um, and sort of other agencies that interface with homeowners. Um, I, I wasn't clear though, whether you actually reached out to each of the homeowners that are in, in the floodplains, you know, individually or is it kind of up to them to to seek out this information? Yeah, like I said, we're using multiple methods to, you know, multiple channels to get to homeowners. We are, uh, we've, we've held hundreds of events in the communities that um, uh, are most impacted, the most vulnerable communities to, to make sure that these, this information is available. Um, we've posted ads on the Link NYC kiosk and at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. Um, we have been working with your offices to get information out to constituents. Um, and we've been working with agencies to make sure that this information is available through their um, regular channels, their outreach and communication channels. Um, you know, the, the website, I should say, is available to all New Yorkers. So um, you know, even though that we have uh, a limited, um, we have some funding constraints in terms of offering the home resiliency audits to certain districts, the website is available to all New Yorkers and they can go to the website, type in their address and understand, you know, get, get information about uh, their flood risk. Um, and, and this is um, maybe kind of, um, uh, maybe a, uh, I don't know, not snide, but um, uh, um, I, I, this question is, there's, there's a $25 billion um, debt, you know, um, and a, NFIP, you know, has um, is over $25 billion debt, you know, after some of the major hurricanes. Are they looking to recoup some of this debt through the insurance rates that they're, they're charging? Um, our homeowners? Um, yes, I, I mean, the, the program is deeply in debt and um, the Bigger Waters Act that I mentioned in my testimony actually increased rates in order to be able to recoup some of that uh, debt and make the program more financially stable. That's why New York City then um, uh, after the Bigger Waters Act passed, um, pursued the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act to slower that pace of increases. And that's why we're um, so uh, uh, focused on affordability as part of our advocacy platform um, in any you know, future reforms to NFIP. Um, so it, it, is, um, it, it is certainly something that uh, lawmakers are very focused on and, and uh, uh, we wanna make sure that affordability stays a part of the conversation. And, and, one, and my last question, because um, my time's running out, um, is grandfathering the only sort of recourse that homeowners have um, to uh, sort of protect themselves from these increased rates um, that, you know, we know are going to inevitably come down the line? Well, there are three things that we're really focused on. First is grandfathering and make sure, making sure that that stays a part of the, the program. The second is means tested vouchers, meaning you know vouchers that are um, based on people's ability to pay. 
And then the third is uh, mitigation credits that are not only focused on elevation because ele elevation, as we've talked about earlier in this hearing, um, is, is uh, obviously quite hard in a dense urban environment like, like, like New York City and not always feasible. And, and the homeowners are aware of these three um, methods that are available. I heard you say you're doing aggressive um, outreach, but again, are you actually touching each of the homeowners that you know this is applicable um, to? So just to clarify, these are the three methods that we are advocating for at the federal level to become part of the NFIP program. They're not all available right now to the program. Um, right now, grandfathering is one of the, the most important affordability tools that we have. Um, and and um, you know, the, the, near, the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, um, who we partner with on uh, floodhelpny.org, actually did a direct mailing to all of the homeowners that um, qualify for these programs in 2015. So we're reaching. Is there any, I'm sorry, Brandon, um, one more. Um, is there, is there any um, help for, um, for commercial businesses that are located in, in these flood zones? Um, my, my district was really inundated um, during uh, Sandy and um, it was very difficult to you know, get them some sort of help? It's a great question. And I'm actually really happy to report that we've just gotten some funding from SBS to be able to uh, expand Flood Help NY to include information for small businesses. So we're going to be doing that very soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Right on. Thanks, Debbie. Okay. Uh, Joe, Janie, thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, can you tell us who we're hearing from? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask because Council Member Constantinides just joined oh, okay. whether he had any additional questions for the administration before they go. Uh, not at this time, no, thank you. Thanks, Cos. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Council Members, thank you. Um, Director Bavici and Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like to now welcome John Baker from the Center for New York City Neighborhoods to testify. After John Baker, I will be calling on Kate Boycourt from the Waterfront Alliance to testify. John Baker, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Good morning. So I'm John Baker. I'm a manager in the policy team at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. And uh, I wanted to thank Committee Chair Brannon as well as the other members of the Resiliency and Waterfronts Committee for holding today's hearing. Um, most, much of my testimony was about Flood Help New York. And uh, I wanna thank Director Bavisi for doing such a great job describing the platform. Um, a, uh, I just wanted to add that you know, for us, a primary goal of this site is to connect in general, low and middle income homeowners uh, with engineers in, in coastal communities to provide audits. Audits And the idea here is that we're very much trying to not only show people their flood risk, but show the, the cost savings that they can receive on their insurance if they're able to go through a resiliency audit, help them lower their current flood insurance payment, and then show them other ways to, to become more resilient to flooding with the carrot of lowering those flood insurance premiums. Uh, and in the uh, elevation certificate itself, um, there's no way of knowing exactly uh, what the elevation of a particular home is without a resiliency audit. So we find that 
uh, most homeowners that go through this process save a pretty significant amount of money. Um, at, at, at a minimum, $200 in most cases once going through our program. Um, what I would like to speak about is our vision for, for expanding flood help. Um, as Director Bavisi said, the, uh, uh, our funding uh, expires at the end of, uh, in 2022, uh, and that we would need to be funded uh, in the next fiscal year to continue providing this service. And um, it's not just about providing this service, but expanding it so that it's, we're not just providing audits in a few neighborhoods, but providing a number of other services as well. Expanding what we have to cover the whole city, uh, as well as um, um, including renters, as well as homeowners. It's, the site is very homeowner focused right now. Um, we're expecting to launch a small business information um, module in the next few weeks. And uh, Council Member Rose, I will be reaching out to your office to let you know when that happens. Uh, um, we'll be uh, expanding. We would like to be able in the future to um, expand the resiliency audit program and the counseling program so we can reach more homeowners throughout the city. And we have some ideas for expanding um, uh, uh, the res uh, what we call the resilience retrofit pilot program. And the idea is once uh, engineers go into these homes and perform these audits that we can find the uh, low cost flood adapt adaptations and install them for homeowners. So right now what happens is, you know, you may get a couple hundred bucks off your flood insurance payment thanks to this elevation certificate, uh, but you, uh, uh, you may, um, but, you know, after counseling, they say hey, you're going to need a whole retrofit to raise your house. And we like to find things like that backwater valve where we can make you more resilient and lower your costs. I'm inspired. John, you can Thank finish you. if you have, you want to finish up? Okay. Oh, there we go. I'm unmuted again. Apologies. <laughs> um, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention about how we'd like to expand this is, is uh, we have a vision for integrating a citizen sci science data and photos about tidal flooding. Um, tidal flooding being, uh, being not during a storm, but during the normal you know, high tide areas and trying to identify places where there's a higher risk of that. Um, I just also briefly want to um, uh, mentioned the, the state Senate, the Hoyleman bill that we were talking about to close that loophole. We're very interested yeah. <laughs> in yeah. getting rid of that. That is completely insane. Um, <laughs> so we have to work on that. Like come January, like, you know, that's nuts. Um, awesome. All right, brother, thank you. Thank you. Um, I will now be calling on Kate Boycourt from the Waterfront Alliance to testify. After Ms. Boycourt, we will hear from Nicole Hernandez-Hammer from Uprose. Kate Boycourt, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Thank you, and thank you, Chair Brannon, and to the council members who've joined us here today. My testimony is rather consistent, I would say, with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods and, and uh, Director Babishis. So I will actually skip over that portion of it, but just here to say that, you know, we are a nonprofit organization, Waterfront Alliance is more than 1,100 community and recreational groups, educational institutions, businesses, and other stakeholders that work to enable and inspire resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all. Uh, New Yorkers and New Jerseyans. We are spearheading a campaign and coalition of which the Center for New York City Neighborhoods is part, and we are calling for action on federal, state, and local levels to increase climate resilience. Um, as I mentioned, our federal platform for FEMA and National Flood Insurance Program is very consistent with the cities. Um, we have been working with the Senator Hoyleman to try to close that loophole and are very ready to be advocating for that in January. So we are very much in align. Um, I'd like to focus a little bit on a few things that the city can do today or tomorrow or as soon as we have those advisory uh, flood maps um, through FEMA that incorporate future risks. Because I think that there's a lot that needs to change at the federal level and we're right there with you. Uh, but there are things that we can do today, uh, including expanding and supporting the Center for New York City Neighborhoods programs to reach all New Yorkers. I think we also need to focus on, as a member, 
Brandon and Chair Brandon focused on today that make sure that those FEMA maps are really the basis for regulation, zoning, planning, and infrastructure development, really knitting together a lot of the programs the city has today, but incorporating future flood risk into informing where density can be born and where it cannot. The second thing that we really want to focus on is, is increasing insurance coverage and access. Um, and we'd like to encourage the city and the state to consider taking action absent federal leadership on that means tested voucher program and to support um, really trying to provide more access to more New Yorkers and, and that, that really need the most uh, support and meeting those premiums uh, until we get that, that federal policy in place. Um, thirdly, we really need to make sure that we're addressing and prioritizing our risks that are rising uh, and faced by public and affordable housing. As you mentioned, um, we, you know, we have 100,000 residential units that are projected to be in the floodplain by 2050. That's an enormous amount. We need a plan for that. And lastly, um, as I said, you know, there's a lot of great programs that are going on um, and offered by Center for New York City Neighborhoods and Flood Help New York. We would love to see those expanded. That pilot program become a more regular program. Uh, development of a voluntary buyout program, uh, expansion of technical systems, and really building from what we have learned so far. And I'm all right, I'll, I'll wrap up there and just say we must act now. We're, we're, we're facing many intersectional crises and uh, we really can't wait any longer. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. You guys are great. Thank you. Thank you. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the Zoom hand function and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Brannon for closing remarks. Chair Brannon. Thank you. Um, who knew you could have so much fun on a Tuesday morning talking about flood insurance? Um, we learned a lot today, I think. Um, certainly, you know, this, this um, you know, it goes back to really what this committee has really zeroed in on, which is, um, the communities, primarily low-income communities of color in the so-called outer boroughs um, who uh, live along the, the city's 520 miles of coastline, um, who are still trying to rebuild and fortify their neighborhoods um, you know, after Hurricane Sandy. Um, and we're sort of in a race against time now as the storms uh, get worse and worse and as, as the climate crisis gets more and more urgent and the situation gets more dire, where we're in a race against time against these maps and, and um, you know, uh, pushing to see that whether the map comes out five, 10, 20 years from now, we can tell you today uh, that the floodplain is greatly expanding and moving uh, further onto dry land, so to speak. Um, and, um, you know, and I think we need to be pushing at all levels of government um, to make sure that folks take this seriously and certainly closing all loopholes like the one we learned about today um, that uh, allow folks to sort of uh, to get away with not being prepared for their own good or for whoever they sell their home to. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, as America's, as one of America's three most um, hurricane vulnerable urban centers, um, you know, all of this stuff uh, is, is part of a larger ecosystem and um, uh, none of this stuff happens in a silo. So we need to be looking at this stuff holistically, um, but also urgently, you know, we, we have to sort of get away from the academic um, and into the application of actually getting this stuff done uh, and making sure that folks have the tools they need to be prepared. Um, and also thinking a little bit more responsibly about um, what we're building in areas that five or 10 years from now, or by 2050, uh, are gonna be squarely within um, the, the floodplain uh, of our city. So um, I thank everyone behind the scenes who helped work on our hearing today, and certainly all the panelists um, who uh, for testifying. And with that, I will adjourn this hearing.